and welcome to another episode of DJF Live. I'm very excited today to be launching a PTZ camera control. As you can see here on the desk, we're gonna go through that in a bit and do a bit of an overview. Um, we're gonna start today's show with a overview video, which will run for about seven minutes as we look into what I've created here, a uh, companion co profile to control um, PTZ cameras, Canon PTZ cameras and then we'll return with a bit of a Q&A. Um, so if you have any questions while you're watching this video, um, jot those down, drop them in the chat, and we can chat through this and get the whole setup. Um, so without further ado, uh, let's take a look at how to control Canon PTZ cameras via a Stream Deck with companion controller software. All right, let's redo that one again. Full start on VLC, full screen, play. If you're looking for a way to increase the production value of your live streams while avoiding the ongoing cost of camera operators, then check out Pan Tilt Zoom Cameras or PTZ Cameras. They're a great way to bring fresh movement and coverage to your production. They can also go places where camera operators cannot. For example, mounted to the ceiling of a venue or keeping a low profile on stage or even removing the need for a camera operator to be physically on set at all. There's also simplicity. You'll see here I have a single ethernet cable for this ceiling mounted camera that is providing power over ethernet, camera control and NDI video out. The wonderful thing is that after your initial investment, these cameras will continue to work for you around the clock, day and night and can be automated to perform maneuvers like this one that you would otherwise need to hire a dedicated operator for. So how do you control these cameras? Well, I've created the DJF PTZ profile for the 32 button Stream Deck. Now as a solo operator, you can control four Canon PTZ cameras while also switching a show. And this whole setup is a fraction of the cost of Canon's own control surface. Not only will this keep your desk tidy with a compact form factor, but there's a ton of control packed into 32 keys that goes way beyond the normal camera control. Let's take a look at some of the key features. We've got manual control of pan, tilt, and zoom. You can easily switch between a fast and a slow speed at the touch of a button to either reposition quickly or to perform an on-air maneuver. You can recall 10 preset positions for each of the four cameras at the touch of a button, and you can save presets simply by long pressing that button, just like you would program your car radio station. You can easily switch your camera's drive motor between time mode and speed mode and reposition mode. Likewise, there's a slow fast preset button that will change the speed of your maneuvers as you go between recall positions. For instance, I'm at recall position number two at the moment and I can smoothly zoom out to recall position one at the touch of button. You can also turn cameras on and off by long pressing the camera button. Then in the camera settings menu, you have full manual control over gain, shutter, iris, white balance, and the focus, the image stabilization, digital zoom, setting a custom white balance, and also the focus speed. There are three user picture profile settings that you can modify for your own purposes. For instance, you can switch between daylight or tungsten white balance. There's a full auto mode, or you can toggle the manual shooting modes between aperture priority, shutter priority, program mode, or full manual. If you hold down the manual button, it will jump to full manual mode. Likewise, you can hold the manual button to reset base parameters such as gain to 0 dB or shutter to 1 60th. Then when you have all your settings dialed in, long press a preset button to be able to recall the position as well as picture profile settings instantly. There's also something I've uniquely developed which is called a gain mode. The idea here is that with gain mode on, it's suited towards a single operator who is controlling cameras and also cutting a show. The preview monitor will gain as you select each camera and it will load that camera into the preview. So then you can simply reframe your next shot and hit cut. Also with gain mode enabled, when you change the manual motor speed, the drive time or the drive speed on one camera, those settings will gain as in they will also be updated on all of the other cameras. For instance, I'm controlling camera two here and I wanna be able to switch from the time drive mode to the speed drive mode. And I also wanna make it slow rather than fast. Now, when I switch over to control camera one, you'll see that camera one settings have been updated also. This simplifies your workflow, reduces the number of button pushes required, and it also reduces errors since it allows your brain to work in a linear fashion, rather than having to think about how you'd previously set up a different camera. Which brings us to the gang mode being off. When gang mode is off, this is designed for a team environment with a dedicated remote camera operator. 
In this environment, you might have a director calling and switching the show. And with the gang off, the preview monitor does not gain when the remote camera operator is selecting cameras. Also, changes made to each of the camera's drive time, drive speed, or reposition mode are independent of each other. For instance, maybe you want to have camera one to be always doing a slow zoom in and out like I've been showing you here so far in the video. And then when you cut away, you want camera two to be quickly reframing so that it's ready for the next insert shot. Turning off gang mode will ensure this independence. You'll note that the cut auto button is also disabled when the gang mode is turned off. And this is to avoid the camera operator making switching decisions. If you'd like that on by default, there is a dedicated cut auto button that you can copy from the back end service pages. Now, on top of all this functionality to control cameras, you also have the versatility to add over 200 other live streaming devices to your system at a later date. Switches, graphics, video playback, encoders, audio mixers, the list goes on. This profile is based on open source software, so your console can grow as your live streaming capability grows also. Let's take a look at what you need to get this operational. You're gonna need one to four Canon CRN300 or N500 PTZ cameras going via ethernet into a switch, preferably PoE to power the cameras and simplify your wiring. From the switch, you're gonna go into the router, from the router into the computer. It can be Mac or Windows or even a Pi. And that's gonna have Companion installed, which is the software running this Stream Deck on the back end. And then that computer or Pi is gonna be plugged in via USB into this Stream Deck, which is controlling the buttons here. Now for video, you're either gonna connect the cameras via HDMI or SDI into a switcher, or these cameras also have NDI HX video out over ethernet, so you can connect your camera with a single cable. So there are four profiles available on my website depending on the type of equipment that you're running. First profile is a four camera PTZ profile for those who just want the camera control. There's the PTZ plus ATEM Mini Pro Switcher, which also includes VLC playback and HDR graphics. There's the PTZ plus the ATEM Mini Extreme Switcher, which has a lot more functionality and also VLC playback and HDR graphics. And then there's the full kit and caboodle, which is a four camera PTZ plus ATEM Mini Extreme plus the ATEM Mini Pro as a backup switcher and VLC playback and HDR graphics. It's all in there, everything that you need to run your whole show with four PTZ cameras and ATEM switches. So if you're looking for an easy and compact way to control your Canon PTZ cameras and you want to increase the production value of your live streams, then visit davidjoshuaford.com slash PTZ to get started with these profiles today. All right, what do you reckon? That's the PTZ profile that I've developed here in order to control four Canon PTZ cameras. Um, so normally this camera is up in the rig, um, as you've seen in my previous shows. Um, but for today, I decided to just bring that down and so I could take a closer look at it. Also, it gives you a bit of a size perspective. Um, this is the Canon CR N300. There's also a 500 version, which is double the cost. Um, but this one's actually, it's quite small. Um, it's very easy to move around. The picture quality out of it is probably going to be akin to getting more of like a, like a handycam style. I mean, you're looking at the quality here. Um, I've got a second PTZ on my um, in my auto queue um, teleprompter up here. Um, so this is essentially the, the quality you can expect out of it. It's 4K, um, just running in HD through this ATEM Mini Extreme. I think the one thing with these cameras is they do require a fair amount of light. So I've got some aperture um, light domes here to just like boost that up, um, otherwise you're going to be boosting the gain and probably getting a bit of noise. Um, but other than like um, the light and um, like a smaller sensor, these are very handy for a live streaming production where you want to be able to get a whole bunch of coverage and you don't want camera operators to be um, here all the time. I mean, you know, I do this show once a week and if I had to hire a camera operator to come and like do all this for me, that would be way too expensive. Um, so it's very nice to, and also, um, not practical, like with this uh, profile, as you saw in the video, you can actually um, build presets. So a lot of what you've seen on this show, like the opener to the show with the, the zoom in, that kind of stuff, they're all um, preset positions. So I have like a wider shot and then a tighter shot and I'll go between um, position one, position two over a set amount of time. So once you've set up those various points in your show, then you can recall them very easily and you can get maneuvers that um, would be probably challenging for some camera operators to deliver that smoothly and certainly with that repetition over time. Also, like for the vertically mounted cameras, 
um, you, you can just get them into places where you couldn't get a camera operator, you know. So it's a very light camera. I could fix that to a balcony or something if I want to get a shot over an auditorium. Um, or, you know, in this studio, I have it usually clamped to the, the ceiling to be able to shoot down um, and onto the stream decks to show you what I'm working on there. Um, but on uh, today, I've brought it down onto the desk and I've got a stream deck here so that we can just sort of move through some of the functionality. Um, so one thing uh, that's not mentioned in the video is the tally light system that's built into this. So um, as I was saying with gang mode on, when you select a camera, it's going to um, show you what cam you're on. So camera four, um, I've actually got my PTZ2 routed into camera input three here. That's why that looks different there. Um, input two and input one. So that's going to follow you as you go. And um, if I had, uh, where are we? So just say I am a director using a different stream deck and I'm over here cutting the show and I can, um, what can I do? I can like bring on a, a key or whatever, you know. So I'm, I'm cutting things independently over here. Um, and then what you'll see is as I cut this, um, which you can't quite see because I'm cutting the program and you see the multi view, um, but the, the tally light will um, follow as you go through. So let's go to um, here and as I select um, different things in preview. So pretend there's like a different director and as I'm cutting, you can see this tally light, there's a little dot which is following each camera. So this means that if you're a camera operator, you can get a head start on what the um, what the director is doing. So maybe the director is wanting to put camera one into preview and you're working on camera one. Just say you were on camera two and you're making some small adjustments like you wanted to, um, where are we? So not camera we're doing three, move in, move out. Um, and then you want to, I'm just going to reset that module. Give me a second. All right. Move in, out. Got that on slow, that's why. I want to go fast. Oh no, I'm doing camera one. What am I doing here? Ah, camera one, okay. Um, and oh, getting my, my cameras mixed up. I am moving camera one, but I'm moving it on the different one. So <laughs> I was going, I was going like this on camera one, zooming in and out. Um, so let's go back to uh, here. So I can follow the tally lamp. Um, so the director would be looking at four, and so I could jump across to four and get that framed up. And then when the director cuts to four, which I won't cut because there's nothing in there at the moment. That would this would all go red. It would essentially go to this panel, um, which is telling you that that's what's on on live at the moment uh, with this red background there. Um, so that's uh, let me get back to here. Um, that's uh, a look at how that kind of works. Um, Ten presets there, so that you can um, very easily save a position and then recall that. That will save. Um, all of the settings. So th wherever the focus point is it, or you could put on autofocus if you like at the moment this shot's just on autofocus. So if I move forward, it will um, follow me, but I could lock that preset to a certain point so that it will um, find that when I recall that. Um, and then as we saw with the drive modes here, is that going to work for me? Let's route it into the other one. Um, it's controlling PTZ3. Um, the, the, the challenge I have here on my ATEM Extreme is that inputs two and four on my switcher have died. So that's why I've moved it across, um, but I need to re-rig some of the inputs on that. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's a, that's a bit of a, a look at that. Um, so any comments? Um, what do you reckon? We've got... Um, Go to Web Technologies wants to see some of the network part of the setup in the live stream. Um, I, that's at the moment, it's like all in a rack down here, so it's a little bit hard to, to show you that. Um, but how could I show you that? Um, essentially, what I've got is a, a Netgear um, PoE switch. So it's an eight port switch. I think it was about 100 and 
twenty dollars or something like that. Um, but it's running t um, two Pies, the computers. It's running the two PTZ cameras. It's got a, a Madwell NDI to HDMI export, uh, like um, deconverter. Um, so all of that is running the power for those devices as well. So that makes it very simple to just plug in a, a simple um, uh, Ethernet cable. Um, so I recommend I recommend that one. That was very easy. It's unmanaged switch. Uh, it's very um, simple to get that up and running. Um, what else we got here? So the back end of this, let me see if I can bring up my, here we go. All right. Um, and I'm just going to get rid of the graphics. So the back end of this looks like um, I've been putting uh, the beat. So within Companion, if you're not familiar with Companion, um, go to bitfocus.io um, is the where bitfocus.io um, and you would download Companion and version 2.2.0 or later or up to 2.1 here. Windows, Mac and Linux is all there. Once you've installed that and you launch the GUI up here, um, that's where all of these modules will be installed. You go to buttons, um, import, you're going to import the profile. And then the PTZ is actually, so this is the extreme page that you're looking at here. Um, I've got an ATEM Mini Pro switcher page, which begins on page 66. And then on page 88 is where the PTZ profile pages are. So on pages 86 and 87 are two backend pages. This is where we do a lot of the preset recall buttons through a long press. And then, so page 88, PTZ1, um, and then PTZ1 has uh, settings and PTZ2 and settings, three and settings, four and settings. So that's the, the sort of number of pages that will be involved in this installation um, to control that um, that is um, eight. That's about ten pages of companion. Um, but essentially, what you see on the um, on the back end, oh sorry, on the front end of this is just what is like one control interface. Um, so you've you can just control each camera like that, and you can jump into the settings for each camera. So for camera one um, or for camera two, control the settings there as you saw in the video. Um, so back here. Um, and then on the back end here is where there's a couple of buttons which can be customized. So we've got the cut and auto button. Um, if you wanted to have that so that's always on, you saw on the video that it'll um, gang will turn that on and off. Um, so if I go, um, where are we? If we go, if we turn off the gang button, then when I press this button, nothing happens. Um, just so that if you are giving this profile to a remote camera operator, but you want to do switching separately as the director, that you can give them a console that doesn't involve cutting the program. Um, otherwise, with gang mode on, it's sort of a solo operator console where you can do all of that on your own. Um, yeah, and so on the back end, you can just like Command C that button from there, and then go to the page and just paste that in over the top if you want that to be always on. Um, another thing that we didn't quite see on the video is um, the drive mode. So on, uh, let me see if we've got, yeah, okay. So what I was saying before was I've, I've routed my video into um, input three, but the control is still on two for this camera. That's why it's a bit off. Um, but so then the different movement modes that you, that you have, uh, let me go to here on PTZ2. So we've got a reposition mode, which is also called normal, um, or else a speed and a time drive mode. So the reposition mode is just going to get to the next position as fast as possible. And let me see if I'm on the right one here. Okay, two. Okay, I've just got two simple presets so you can so when I get too far off um, into the Netherlands of the studio. Um, all right, so see how that was pretty quick. And then on, you can choose either like a speed mode and that will, this is like the, um, what's this one? This is fast one. So going in and out. 
or you could hit this button to bring up a preset of slow. So maybe I put that on 20 seconds and then I move into this one. And so that'll just give me a very slow move in. Um, under the settings, this is where you can actually manually set a time. So if you, for example, wanted um, like a 15 second maneuver for a program, you could, you could do that in here by just setting 15 seconds. Um, and then when you, when you go back to here, it's gonna take 15 seconds to get back to whatever position you're calling here. So I've uh, also got a bit of different exposure settings there. You can see that's why it adjusted um, the iris. So the iris doesn't really adjust over time. It kind of happens right away. Um, whereas the, the other sort of pan tilt zoom functions, they'll happen slowly over a period of time. Um, so that's how that drive mode works. And so essentially what you're wanting to do is you're um, bringing up a camera. So I might bring up camera one, but let's just work on two for the moment. And I would bring this up into, uh, I would either like reposition if I'm off air and I just want to like very quickly pull up a different position um, or, and so, and then maybe can like find my starting point and then I would switch it into to the drive mode, either time or speed. Um, here I'm using a 15 second one and I would um, hit, I would begin the maneuver and hit cut. Now, when I do that, it's going to jump across. So I'm just gonna um, begin the maneuver and then you would hit cut. So that's where that would come into the next position. Um, so you get a smooth transition between shots. All right, let's take a look at some questions. We've got some questions coming in. Um, and so thank you for that. Um, John says, good evening. I got your email, John. I will respond to that. I've been madly setting up for this uh, live stream, so I'll get to that. Um, great question here from Emmanuel, which was, can you use these setups only with Canon cameras or can you use other brands? So um, this particular profile that I've got on my website, that is only going to work with those two Canon cameras. Um, there are a ton of other camera, uh, ton of other PTZ cameras out there on the market. Um, you know, there's, there's a ton to choose from. So if you want to control those, there are ways of doing that through the companion software. There's other modules. Um, I just, I own two PTZ cameras, so I was able to build this particular profile for the Canon ones, um, which is why I've sort of like invested a whole lot of time in these two ones. It would be great if we could just like switch them out and plug it in, but the, uh, the module that is in companion is um, speaking to a specific can, um, Canon protocol, which is, I think it's XC or something rather than Visca. So it is a bit more specific. So it's a great question because what I'm showing you here today is, um, at least in this incantation, is limited to those two Canon um, PTZ cameras. But with those two cameras, it works very well. And I would say I I like, I, don't, I guess all my other cameras are Canon. So I, I just like Canon as a, as a brand, as its image quality. I've been using it for 20 years or something. Um, I've just bought the R5C, um, new RF lenses. So I'm very much in the Canon ecosystem. Not that you necessarily need these PTZ cameras to, um, you know, you don't need Canon cameras to be in the PTZ space. And there are cheaper versions of it. Like this one here is about 2,600, I think. Um, for the 300 version, and it's about double that for the the five, the N 500 version. So they're not cheap. Um, you know, you could buy some nice um, cinema glass for that kind of um, cost. But uh, for me and what I do in live streams, and also just here in the studio, I wanted to have some cameras that were automated so that I could build that into a run of show. So what you saw in today's um, setup from um, cutting to a camera and then it um, comes into this position. And then as I go to a video, the camera will reposition to something else. All of that can be programmed into a stream deck, which makes it um, very handy. And when it comes to live streaming, I've just found using PTZ cameras so much easier than um, playing around with DSLRs because they're always on and I don't mind them being on because they're kind of built for that. So I'm not sort of thinking of putting tons of hours on a cinema sensor. Um, but it's mostly that pan tilt zoom function, you know, the remote function of that to be able to um, control a camera. 
Um, where I think they come very, very much in handy, like PTZ cameras, is when you can combine them in a live stream. So just say you're doing an event and maybe you have two or three PTZ cameras and they're like a wide shot and maybe you've programmed some um, functionality that sort of zooms in a bit or zooms out just to give it a bit of life and maybe some like sort of cross shooting with two more cameras. If you're doing a panel discussion, you could have preset positions where you quickly recall different panelists and you could assign them to buttons with people's names. So you could hit John, you know, and hit that button and it'll just pull it straight up and then you can cut to it. That makes that um, very easy for a single operator kind of um, control cameras and cut a show, you know, in an age of multitasking. Um, but then I think also if you're doing like um, speakers who are walking around a stage and that kind of stuff, having an actual camera operator with a long lens who can um, adapt quickly on the fly is um, something that is is very handy. And I'd, depending on the event, I'd still want to have that. Um, for smaller things, I think PTZ is great. Um, also, during I'm still having clients during um, this post-COVID era who are um, they, you know don't want very many people in the room, and so being able to like put a PTZ camera in there just makes them feel safer. That you know if they're spending a day doing a presentation, that there's um, not more bodies in the room. So um, that's something to consider. Um, the main I think so if I was to talk about some of the limitations of this. I think the main limitation of this implementation of the Stream Deck is the not having a joystick. I think having like Canon's actual, Canon sells like a $2,000 console, which has a joystick on it. And that uh, would make that easier to like manually, you know, move around and um, just the, you know, the, the physicality of a joystick, I think is great. Um, you can achieve a similar sort of thing with the buttons that are on this um, Stream Deck. Uh, let me bring this up here. So with uh, these ones, you can go up and down and like that. So this is on fast mode, but if I switch this on to slow, um, you can actually do it more slowly. If you're zoomed in a long way, it slows this down. And you can do two buttons at once to you know bring that up um, like that or to go down, you know, you could sort of move across and then add in a maneuver up, that kind of stuff. Um, what are we on? Three. Bring that back to camera three. There we go. Okay, my camera's mixed up. It's put me back on three in my little circle. Um, so that's the sort of manual control that you have in here. And I found that's um, sort of good enough for uh, what I'm doing. And but yeah, that's something to consider if you need you know a joystick, then you may want to get the Canon console as well. Um, I I haven't got it um, partly because I just didn't want more gear. You know, like maybe down the line sometimes I'll have it. But what I like about this particular setup is it's just it's very compact. It can sit on the desk in a very small footprint. Um, so I can go about my work and my live streaming and I can, it's more of like a computer console so I can be looking at the screen um, and then um, just rather than my whole desk being taken up by like um, all the control cables and that kind of stuff, this just runs off um, USB so it's very easy to plug it in or unplug it and move it around. Um, and I showed you in the in the video there, there was a bit of a diagram of the setup. So it's very simple in terms of um, you'll have a, your computer, which will have a companion on it, USB connection to the Stream Deck that you're seeing here, and then the, the cameras will be on the network setting. So that's essentially how we're doing that. Um, all right, next question. Uh, John says this app is specifically designed for Canon PTZs. Yes, this is uh, for Canon. Um, what's my view on Bird Dog NDI PTZ cameras and converters? Um, I haven't used them very much. As I was saying before, I, I like the Canon stuff because of, I don't know, maybe I just buy into the sort of Canon colors and the Canon image type stuff. Um, but it's it's a brand that I'm familiar with for many years. So that's why I kind of like that because I feel like I could add my C200 or R5C into this system and get similar sort of colors for matching this if I needed to. Um, I have, I did buy a Bird Dog NDI converter a while back, but I had to return it because this particular um, camera 
only does NDI HX. So that's the 8-bit version. So if you're running video out over um, HDMI or SDI, you're going to get a 10-bit signal out. So that's and, and better latency, lower latency. That's the ideal way of doing it. If you run it over the network, you'll add in a little bit of latency, um, and you'll add in uh, the NDI HX will be um, 8-bit video, so a little more compressed. Um, I haven't found that too much of a problem because this particular camera I use for the sort of um, non-lip sync ones, and I sort of put that on as like a product shot top down. Um, but something to consider, and the NDI devices that I use were the full fat NDI, and they weren't compatible with this. So um, I ended up getting a Madual um, NDI to HDMI converter, and so that's what I have in my um, rack when I'm running it through the network um, cable. And this worked really well. I think they're 400 bucks. I bought them secondhand from b &H for like 320. Um, and they're very, very um, versatile. So I've enjoyed that. Um, Sebastian, good to have you here. Is it possible to control the NDI filters on the CR and 500 with your profile? Yes, it is. So um, if we go to this one, um, what we have under the um, settings here is you'll have image stabilization on and off, and you'll have ND on and off. Um, and uh, I'm trying to remember. I don't think I don't think the 300 has it. That's why I didn't really show that in that video. Um, but uh, the 500, I'm pretty sure, does have it, and that is built in. So that will that will control that on the on the 500 version. Um, all right. What do we got? John, um, very astute John, noticing that we're running out of available companion pages. Um, we are. And um, let me see if I can show you the map because it's getting, it's full. And I actually had to take some stuff out. So um, the other thing that we've got is, which I will probably get to in a, next week, um, is talking about the DJF profile 3.1 which is now on the website, and I'll go into that at a later date. It's got H2R version 2 in there. Um, if you've bought that before, that's a, a free um, update, so you just need to go to the website and grab that um, and download that. Um, but there's there's a few changes to the pages. Uh, I'm trying to find my map. Marketing, where are we? Under here. Under the map for the oh, I cannot find it. So many things in here. Um, what did we have? PDF. Oh, and page map. I think that was it. There we go. Screen. Um, let's go. Key map. All right. So, um, this is what the the back end is looking like. Um, there's a ton of stuff in it. So if you get the full profile, which is the, the ATEM Mini Extreme controller and the ATEM Mini Pro controller, it's great to have a sort of back switcher running. Um, as I think with my Extreme is like, I've got two ports now that are dead to an So um, I think I'm going to in my um, ATEM Mini Pro as a sort of backup streamer to have that kind of running in the background. Um, and then the, the to have that kind of running in the background, um, and then the the four camera PTZ control. So um, in the DJF 3.0, there were some kind of um, vertical pages for the mobile. Um, so which is like a 15 button vertical one. So I've just I've reduced the number of pages used by that. There's two for the Pro and two Extreme. Um, so you'll notice one here. 96, 7, 8, 9 are the vertical ones for um, if you're doing, if you're controlling it on the phone. Um, and then the cameras occupy sort of the back end of um, companion. And then extreme here, as you can see, that is like um, the first 60 pages of the extreme. And then there's about 20 pages for the pro. The extreme just has a, a ton more um, stuff in there because of all the super source and stuff so that's kind of what's looking um if you if you only get the ptz profile then you're only getting like you're only filling out the 10 pages 
at the back of the companion, so you've got a ton of space for that. Um, but that's kind of what that looks like. Um, and yeah, sort of about this the other day. You've got to um, this like reduce the which wasn't really useful. Um, and one of my that really matter um, like uh, the All right. How are we do? Uh, all right. We got four. Any chat, and we'll we'll try and get through them all. Otherwise, uh, let's. The thing. Uh, um, yes. Answer that. Um, cameras. Um, I think I probably went through that. Um, just uh, uh, is Canon, and I've always shot lenses. And if you can invest in a particular and get to know that really well, goes a long way. Because time really matters. Um, fumbling around with. The capabilities and limit back to back. Well, I'm, there are definitely some power limitations with that camera um, to a VMAL. I've found it just to, and I've had the camera like ultra, and it is still kind of stuff. So, can do and what it can't do. Stick with the. What is the best way to get live feed from PT stations via? Or. Um, that's probably a bit more in depth. To right now. Or. It is basically. Um, on. Uh, Sending video over the network, have a um, under my. Let me see if I get this. Here we go. Um, so under clean this up a bit. So under my module device, um, I have this uh, video. So we. And, you know, choose what we're outputting to. I'm just doing 2997P, and we can choose audio, and we can select a source. So I've got um, two PTZ cameras on the network, and they're both sending video. So if I wanted to, I could actually switch the Madrol device to be um, receiving the um, PTZ1 camera, which is what you're looking at now. So what you're looking at here in this screen is um, my, whereas my PTZ2 is normally plugged into um, the module device and sort of coming through that way. Um, so that's, that's, that wasn't too bad. There is a little bit of like, um, backend type stuff, which, um, takes a, a bit of like settings and that kind of stuff. And I will do a blog post at some point in terms of what settings to use with these particular cameras. Um, once you get that set and you can control your network. So like having your own router, I think is very important in this scenario that you need to within your sort of local domain. Um, you don't want to just like go plug it because these cameras do need to find particular addresses and setting that up before you get to location is is definitely the the way to go. Um, um, uh, John um, HX HX in the full have NDI built into this. Um, if it was, you know, 10 bit. But two stream decks or one for the BTZ. Yeah. You could plug in as many stream decks as the and the power can handle. And I think there's stream decks off 
I've got two, so I haven't really tested in terms of its uh, reliability. You, um, you know, computers, like you could have some running audio or someone who's like a um, remote this profile to control the computer, have a different director with um, network but um, bad by I don't know what's going on there. Hopefully, let me setting. Yeah, I get this really weird. Hopefully, we're um, we're gonna. Um, I I don't know ATM Extreme. Um, back to good. I don't know what that was. Probably some, some don't know if it's a streamer. So, this question um, so within the back to this camera. Got or a pro you ETZ control the different um you X stream uh, home page here or like H two R and X out in uh, in the menu D camera kind of menu system works any stream deck has access to all those you could have multiple multiple ones right. So the eye for live events with is happening from and see have the I wouldn't recommend using the event um, because I start to notice about about. 20 milliseconds um depending on your that kind of stuff so um yeah but um the best and then hdmi would be more latency you're getting 10-bit image out of these cameras so that's pretty good there just want to Uh, I'm be willing to write this for into that at some point. I wanted to for these particular cameras, which is using the Canon Pro. It's like a lot of a lot of the commands work, but so that's where. Um, but there may be uh, room down the line to sort of take what I've got and I could maybe adapt it for a more generic um, interface like
myself. Okay, there we go. Um, we are back. Um, I'm gonna have to look into my, my settings here. This is the ATEM Mini Extreme, um, which was giving me buffering problems. Weirdly, it was saying um, YouTube's not receiving enough video to main, maintain smooth streaming. Look at DGF 3.1, look at some of the, the profiles that are coming out. Um, so until then, have a great weekend. All right.